Amen. You may be seated. I, uh, interesting thing, you know, you, <laughs> as uh, I, Thomas had called me a couple of times, and, and uh, I'd uh, met Thomas at uh, pastor's conference with uh, Dennis ever last fall in uh, Bellevue. And uh, I'd known Dennis for, I guess, 15 years or so, because there's all of us Calvary pastors, we kind of gather together at the pastor's conferences. And, and it's one of the things, it's, it's, it's awesome to get together with those of like-minded as to which the, the word of God and as to which we teach and, and not quenching the spirit and, and just allowing God's word to prove and to proclaim God's word. And it's all connected. Genesis 1 1 to Revelation 22 21. And, and the wonderful thing is that several years ago, and the reason I truly believe I'm standing here today, and I always think about it, you know, I don't know, people may not think, but when you walk up to a pulpit, you know, you think about those who have gone before you. And an interesting thing, it was a little country church. I've, I've, I have taught at several little country churches that are slowly, as they say, the saints have gone before us, and then they close the doors, and then there's a lot of them around right now, faithful people yet. But there was one that I, 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 I filled the pulpit at for a while, or I taught for a little while, and they were actually worn into the carpet. There were footprints, kind of like you see, uh, like the Marines, you know, whenever they first get off the bus at, for boot camp, you know, there's painted footprints. Well, the carpet was actually worn like that, and I remember walking up and going, that fits. But back in, uh, as I said, as I was looking for something, you know, for today, as, uh, as one of the columns that uh, I had made past reference to, and I thought, well, I'll use it for a study guide. And uh, for the past 20 years or so, I do a weekly devotional that comes out in the new local newspapers, and it's also on a couple of different Christian radio stations. And uh, I thought, well, I'll find that, and that'll go right along with the topic, and I'll have my, my outline and, and, and my notes. And I found a letter that I had written. I typed it out, and I actually mailed this to Dennis. And that was back in uh, September the 18th of 2018. And I had been coming up here, and uh, the elder at our church was at uh, rehab over here in Madonna. And uh, I had been coming up to visit. And uh, I would time it to where that then I could come, I would hang out in the afternoon, and then I'd, when supper time come, you know, I'd come over here, and, and I'd get in on the study, and then I'd drive back. Well, finally, Dennis said, man, he says, you, you, know, you ought to stay at the house and go back the next morning, you know, because by the time we got done and got to talking and everything, you know, I wasn't getting home till, you know, like 2 o'clock or 1 o'clock in the morning or something, you know, and, Driving those roads at night, it's kind of like deer hunting without a license, you know, that type of thing. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, uh, but anyhow, Dennis had then asked me, he said, hey, he said, I'm going to go to Vietnam and teach. He said, would you want to, you know, next time you come up, you know, on, on, then you would fill in. And I said, sure, I'd love to. Well, in the meantime, my old car, and previous to that, I'd quit my day job. And, you know, those who have gone into the ministry, that you walk by faith and not by sight, as the priest carrying the, the Ark of the Covenant into the river, the river, you know, that even though it swelled, it doesn't part until you actually take that step. And I had, had gone from making a, a salary to, you know, what the Lord provided. Well, this old car is, you know, 200 and some thousand miles and this and that. And I had, at that time, I had somebody in Lincoln and I had somebody in Kansas City in the hospital. And so I was going this way and that way to, to visit in the hospital. And my car had broken down twice. And both times it had broken down just as I got back to my little hometown. And, and it was kind of odd because then on the next Sunday then I'd show up at church, you know, I'd drive my old pickup to church and, and, and I'd show up and I'd, I'd say, praise the Lord, my car broke down, awesome. And they'd say, what is going on? And I said, you realize I went all the way to Lincoln and back twice. And this last time I come back and just as I was pulling out of the gas station heading toward the house, the car went chunk chunk. 
but it let me coast to a nice, safe parking spot. But it happened twice. The next time it was coming back from Kansas City, and it, it broke down. And I forget, one time it was a radiator, and another time it was something else, and timing chain and this and that. So anyhow, I, at the meantime, the, the elder from the church, he, was, he had gone home, and so it was just like two days before I was just scheduled to speak, or it wasn't very long. I called Dennis and I said, Dennis, I said, I, I, my old car, I'm just afraid I, to drive it that far. And ever since, and Dennis, you know, Dennis, he was, okay, you know, no big deal, you know, no big deal. I mean, that seems good, but I felt bad about that. I felt I could have done it. And, uh, and in the interim, uh, a couple from the church, they, they bought me in a newer car perfect fit it had belonged seriously it had belonged to a 99 year old woman and it was one of those things you know the, the tires were 10 years old but I had to get new ones because they were weather checked you know that type of thing but anyhow I kept I sat down and I told Thomas I said you know I said if I ever get the opportunity or, or the invite to come and to teach up here in, in Calvary Chapel Lincoln that I'm not going to deny and I wrote, and this is just a little bit of the letter that I wrote Dennis. I said, greetings, dear bro. Thank you so for the hospitality. And it must have been a Thursday, last Thursday night, 8, 16, 18. I appreciate the place to lay my head in restful anticipation of my trip back to Missouri. I missed seeing you Friday morning, but awoke at 4.30 and by 6, and I could not detect anyone else awake. Since you have been up since 3 a.m. the day before, I did not want to disturb your well-deserved nap. And then I wrote, please thank David and Steve for their encouraging words concerning our brother who was recovering at Madonna. And there was one thing that I, that I remembered that I put on down in this letter was, you know, that the people that we have that draw, to, that God draws together, and especially in the smaller fellowships is that you know when the fellowship is small and there are those who have supported the Lord's work for many years are suddenly taken away it does leave a hole in our hearts but it leaves an opportunity for God's love to then flourish and grow through others and so then as we continue in faith and growth and, and I just love Peter, I mean, Peter is my guy. I mean, it's, I, I kind of felt like that my whole life growing up, you know, a 10 feet tall and bulletproof kind of guy. That's Peter, right? You know, you know, like with Malchus, Jesus is going, oh, Peter, what the world? You know, oi, bay, you know, here, let's put your ear back on, you know. But in 2 Peter, chapter 3, verses 17 and 18, you know, Peter says, you know, be wary that you not fall from your own steadfastness, but that you should grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As we grow, as then growing requires nourishment, re nourishment we get from the Lord, we get the Holy Spirit that waters the word. And as the word goes along, then I'm reminded of the reason that I am with Calvary Chapel as I was, uh, as to which some of you may, I was born and, and grew up in a, and raised in a denominational church, so to speak, and a little country church and this and that. This was back in the 60s. And uh, as many of you might go, oh my goodness, and others of you going, oh yeah, I remember that. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm cool. Oh, well, by the way, I'm the same age as Dennis was, so. If anybody's wondering, you know, this, it just, he had more hair. But at that time, I was serving in a, in a little, I had uh, gone through my prodigal son time, and I was serving as an elder in a little country church. And it was one of those things that it started out small, and as the, as, as the congregation grew, then the pastor went off, he took an exit ramp somewhere. And I, the wonderful thing about this ministry is that it's a word of God. That's that. You know, and that was one thing that they, you know, going to Bible college, whenever I was able to, finally, they said, you know, if you ever come to confrontation, 
You know, so just open your Bible and say, is this what you have a problem with? So often, you know, we have the world, the flesh, and the devil. They come at us. But back some 30, 30 years ago, there was a radio program called To Every Man an Answer with Chuck Smith. Does anybody remember that? Amen. Anybody remember that? To Every Man an Answer. And that was, that was our, our lifeline, so to speak. And, and I was farming and, and raising cattle and hogs and, and serving in this church. And he would come on there, and I just loved it. And some of the things that I remember from Pastor Chuck was that he would call in and he would say, you know, I think the question was something to do with, well, you know, that Bible, you know, this or that. And, and Chuck would say, and at that time he said, you know, I have taught through the entire Bible, Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22-21, five times. And he says, every time I go through it, the Lord reveals himself a little more. And every time that he reveals himself, I feel within myself that, oh, everybody must have already known this. How, how, why didn't I, how couldn't I, why couldn't I see this? And, and I thought about that, and I thought, you know, I've been waiting to hear that. But there was one other thing that Chuck, uh, he would, uh, once in a while, there would be a, a, a question that would come in, and, and, and Chuck would just flat out say, he said, well, I don't know. You know, we'll have to get back with you on that. And I thought, that's good. <laughs> you know, that's good. But then there was also those questions, and it seems like I get more and more of those, as well as they're a question, but they're, they're a leading question or a pointed question that, you know, that taken in its context, uh, you know, it demands only one answer. And I... I got to say, I take this from Pastor Chuck, is that oftentimes, and even today, I'll, and I guess I'm getting better at it than telling people, you know, that sounds nice, I guess, but that's not in the Bible. That is not in the Bible. There are so many man-made phrases. There are so many cliches. There are so many, as I say, phrases that have been conjured up that are designed to end the conversation. Now, this uh, talking about the end times church, and I thinking about the word of God, I think about some of the men of faith that have come before us. Uh, there was a, another man uh, by the name of William Booth. Has anybody ever heard of William Booth? Amen. How do we know William Booth? Salvation Army, right? Okay. Different than it is today. Okay, but he is, this is one of his quotes. He says, I consider that the chief dangers which confront the coming century will be religion without the Holy Ghost, Christianity without Christ, forgiveness without repentance, salvation without regeneration, politics without God, and heaven without hell. And that, I see that even in our small town. There's 1,100 people in the town that I'm from. And uh, there, 25 years ago, we sold the farm and moved to town. And that's when I uh, began this, in earnest, this journey, I'll say, to, uh, to expound upon God's word to the Holy Spirit. Uh, the uh, John Wesley, and this goes clear back, uh, William Booth was 1900, John Wesley was 1750, and one of the things that he said is what one generation tolerates, the next generation will embrace. Uh, I mean, that's, that's here and now. And, but people don't want to say something because, oh my goodness, you'll offend somebody. I've I've had people come up to me before, you know, and say, well, did you know that so-and-so was in the congregation? I'm sure they were offended. And I said, well, I, what was it? You know, it always ends up with, we all need Jesus. We all need Jesus. But John Wesley said, people who wish to be offended will always find some occasion for taking offense. Hey, that was in 1750. 
You know, when you see all of these things coming together, don't think it's anything new. I mean, you know, we'll go back to, you know, that uh, there's nothing new under the sun. I mean, we'll go back to that and realize that this is, this is what's going on. He says that reading Christians are growing Christians. When Christians cease to read, they cease to grow. And I have a, on my phone and on my computer, I have a concordance. And, of course, you can get anything on these. I mean, it's amazing. You know, you can go to a, you know, a lexicon. You can go to, you know, the Hebrew dictionary, the Greek, anything. You know, just right there at your fingertips. And I have one to where I can pull up, I can pull up 63 different English versions of the Bible. 63 different. Now these, now they, they, that does not include the cult ones like the New World one, you know. That doesn't include them, but still some of the same language is in some of these. Some of the same language. The, uh, there was another evangelist called Smith Wigglesworth. I don't know if you know him. He was, in a, he was a, one of the healing passages back in 1940. And he said, there are four principles we need to maintain. First, read the Word of God. Second, consume the Word of God until it consumes you. And third, believe the Word of God. And then fourth, act upon the Word of God. Well, now the teaching method to which I have embraced or which the Lord has placed on my heart is one of observation, interpretation, and application. And it's always that application one. Where as we think about that. And as I said, I can get on my phone and, and I do sometimes, depending on where I'm at, I'll, I'll do my morning devotions or something, but there's nothing like having the Word of God in your hand. There's nothing like having to, getting to touch it. As I go through and I read and I think about Pastor Chuck as to what he said, and that every time I go through, and this may be something that you may enjoy, I'll take, a, I'll take my ink pen, and if the Lord really touches me on something, I'll circle the number. Years ago, I used to underline and all this, and then it got to where like the fifth time I couldn't read it, so I quit doing that. But it's amazing to me how as I read through it now and I look back to the ones that I've circled and I think about what was going on in my life back then. Now, as we see the world going the way that which it is going and we see the essence of compromise and we see this so-called ecumenism as we don't want to offend anyone, And as I said, a little town we're from, there's 1,100 people and there's six churches. And uh, of course, just like oftentimes as Calvary Chapel, I say we're the Gideon church. You know, we're the least of the least and uh, the smallest of the small, but yet we have faith. And the faith is what keeps us going. Uh, as I think about these times that we come, I'm... Uh, Reminded that that uh, it's the very essence of Jesus Christ, and as it says from Revelation chapter 19, verse 10, for the very testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Now, turn to, if you would, to Matthew 24, and we're going to touch there for just a moment. Matthew 24, and we're going to go down to, we're going to go down to 36. Uh, Jesus taught, and quite often he would teach in what we call parables. And parables being as oftentimes people will call it a parable, you know, they'll say, well, that's a, you know, a heavenly message with an earthly meaning, and that, that does sound logical, doesn't it? Doesn't it? And, uh, and yet, the parables are so often prophetic. Now, I've noticed that over the years that that which has been preserved for us was, was there for a reason. 
And that's why so many times that we can read over it and read over it. And even somebody like Pastor Chuck Smith, you know, he said after five year, five times, he's still revealing himself. And as we draw closer and closer, that's why as when we worship before we come to the study and, and we, you know, we enlist the Holy Spirit for God desires those who will worship him in spirit and truth. But from Matthew 24, and Jesus had been asked, asking him he says you know I want the guy's asking me he says you know Jesus you know tell us when these things are going to happen tell us when all this is going to happen because there was so much going on right then so much fulfillment and yet Jesus was talking near and talking far and and as I try to think about what it would be like you know someone that had all knowledge and everything I, I often think about when I'm trying to explain something more complicated than they should ever be able to handle to a little child. And there's a place where you only ha you can only tell them so much because you know it's just way over that. And as children of God who have been called, that's that's the way the word is sometimes, and that's why we continue to grow. And that's why we continue. That's why we continue studying the same book, the same chapters, the same words over and over, as God reveals Himself. And, but in Matthew 24, beginning in 36, Jesus said, But nobody knows the day nor the or hour, and no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. And uh, I'll have to, uh, I should mention that uh, I today am mainly in the New King James, but I also am a King James. So I'm not a King James only, but New King James, King James, and also the Geneva Bible. I, I love the 1599 Geneva. That's good reading. And, uh, good nourishment. As I said earlier, I had 63 versions. Some of those are really bad. And, uh, but then in verse 37, Jesus gives us a hint. These are, this is what to look for. Okay, when we, when we look for these things happening, and now in other places Jesus would say, when you look for this, you know, you need to know. You need to be ready. Because in verse 37 he says, But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. So the days of Noah, what was going on? Okay, chapter 6 in Genesis, we know Noah was building the ark. Oh, he had like a you know, hundred years invested in that. It had not rained, you know, but yet he was laboring. How many converts did Noah have? He had, there were just eight of them. You know, their three sons, their wives, him and his wife, there were just eight of them. We don't, we don't, in, no converts. But he continued in the faith. He continued in the faith. And, and what, what is another sign? So we know that Noah was doing this. We know what the struggle was. We know that he was preparing this ark, and the people were oblivious. Why? Because it never rained. You know, God watered the ground with the, with the dew, and then the moisture came up. Anybody ever, ever farmed? I mean, if you've never farmed, let me tell you, if you're out working the fields and it starts to get dark, oftentimes you'll have to quit because moisture will come up. And, and I've seen it to where as you're going along and uh, everything's working good and then, you know, you'll get up to maybe 10 o'clock at night and you'll just about get stuck in the same place that you went through earlier and it was just nice and dry. And that, that always, I'm always reminded of that. But to that case, but he says... In verse 38, for as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. And they did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will the coming of the Son of Man be. And he, you know, he goes on. Two men will be in the field, one be taken, the other left. He goes on in that. But he wants us to know. Now, when we come to that time and we see two men in the field, one taken, one left, wow, hey, 
That's pretty obvious. You know, I, I got this, Lord. I, I, even I can understand that one. And if you're still here, it's like, oh, whoops. But, but go before that. Go before that. Okay, chapter 6 tells us from Genesis that everyone that was on this earth, that their hearts and minds were continually filled with evil and wickedness. Continually. Conjuring up wicked and evil things. But they were going through the motions of being married and getting married. What kind of a marriage do you think would constitute that we could call evil and wicked and perverted? What kind of marriage would that be? Wouldn't be the righteousness of God. Now, Jesus, he, uh, he quoted, as a matter of fact, he said, uh, he said something about that. And uh, when he talked about marriage and he actually was on to the Pharisees. They were asking him something. It was one of those pointed questions that was supposed to trip him up. And back in 19.4 of Matthew, Jesus said, Have you not read? You know, somebody comes at you and, and tries to turn God's word back on you. You know, and I don't know if you've ever had that happen. That's, that's what a lot of these man-made phrases and things are that will come at you. And... It's obvious, you know, that they're just taking the word of God, just like Satan did. You know, that's what he did. I mean, the original temptation, of course, we have that in chapter 3. And what was that? Did Satan, you know, tell Eve to, you know, go out and commit adultery, go out and kill, murder, steal, rob, rape, loot? No, he just told her in a question like, nice and easy, so that the logic could have its work. Just flat out said, "Didn't God? Did, did did God really say that? Was that really God's word? Is that really what that said? Is that really what that meant?" How much do we see that today? We see that today. It's so simple. We can just put our fingers there and say, "This is God's word right here. This is what God said. That's it." But that doesn't please the flesh. So the original temptation came from Satan. So if you have a you know, something comes in, that's why we're to have every thought under subjection to the Lord. That's why the Holy Spirit will speak to us. There was a uh, old black and white movie many years ago, and uh, it, was, uh, it was about a, a, a guy that Satan, and, and it was really interesting because the technology was way, way back. You know, they didn't have the special effects, but it was... Satan would come up on one shoulder, and then the angel would come up on the other shoulder, and it would talk to him, and it was like they couldn't get him by temptation. They couldn't get him by the lust and all this, and oh, man, they thought they had him, and then Satan would meet up with these demons, and they'd say, well, what do we do? Well, then finally he, he won the Irish sweepstakes, and that did it. But Satan will come, and he'll bring logic, just like with Eve, you know, it's just like, when logic enters in, even though the Word of God says this, and it's absolute, it's true, it's truth. You know, and I'll, we say, you know, the Word of God is true, and I, I've said this before, is that the Word of God no way is true, but it gets truer as time goes along, because we see so much happening that it's all set up, it's all there. As we get closer to that time to when God's going to say, he's just going to say well that's it I've had enough and he's going to take the believing church out you know, and, it, and it, I'm real sad to say you know it's just like that phrase you know that's why there's a stairway to heaven and a highway to hell and I grew up in the era that I went, I went to all those concerts a long haired country boy I mean we still we still got hooting and hollering and go to all those summer jams and all them and now I can't stand it. I can't listen to any secular music. It's, it doesn't glorify God. 
it, it's, it's, it's for naught. After all, Satan was a worship leader in heaven until he was thrust out. He was more beautiful than anything. But when human logic comes in and we say, oh, that sounds good, that sounds logical. When I quit my day job and I, I, I was just like, I just can't take it, I, I can't, I don't want to be here. I was in a, an office setting and it was not a Christian environment and I, everybody knows me, they, I've been called a fanatic many times. You know, I say, well, I'm not just a fan, I'm, I believe. I believe. And as they say, you know, it's a B-I-B-L-E, that's the word for me. I stand alone on the word of God. Remember that song we used to sing? Any you ever sing that in Sunday school? Do you still sing it today? Good. Good. But Jesus said, when the Pharisees were trying to trip him up on a question about marriage, he said, Have you not read, he who made them in the beginning made them male and female, and said, For this reason man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh, so then they are no longer two but one flesh. Therefore what God has joined together, let not man separate. Man and woman. One and two. Now I saw this going on back in 2004. And uh, at that time, uh, I was uh, pastoring a small country church, and my wife was the county, county clerk, and she was the deputy county clerk. And so, and it's kind of interesting at that time, I, the weddings that I performed, uh, a lot of the wet marriage licenses had both our names on, because I would perform the ceremony, and then she would file the, you know, the certificate, the license. And I don't know if you remember, but back then, there was a vote and many of the states amended their state constitution to define a word. Okay, they didn't make law, but they defined a word. They amended the state constitutions. Uh, I looked and I couldn't find, I've got that information somewhere, but I couldn't find it as the exact numbers and everything. I know Missouri did, and I think Nebraska did too. And that's all it was. We, they, they defined the word marriage to be between one man and one woman. Definite. And some of the states even, some of the states even added as to what they, uh, it was a, uh, oh, I forget what they call it now, it was a legal document that guaranteed the same rights and privileges of a marriage to any other set or group. Okay, it was a, an, another legal, uh, it was, a, what was it, a public certificate or something like that, a certificate of union or something like that. But that wasn't good enough for the devil. Now at that time, it was not law, but the judge came forward and said, you know, I said, no, you can't do that, it violates the 14th Amendment, you know, that, that provision in the Constitution that provides for, you know, happiness, health, and wealth, and, you know, barring sexual, barring sex, race, or creed, you know, type thing. It didn't say sexual orientation, it said sex, race, and creed. Well, anyhow, this judge said, no, you can't do that. And because he said he couldn't do that, he did not create law, he just undefined that which it had been defined. See, it didn't, the law, the amendment to the Constitution did not make law, it just defined the word. Civil certificate, that's what that was called. But see, when they, def well, several of the states did this, but that wasn't good enough. Satan wanted to alter the word. We know the Bible says in John chapter one, verse one, he said, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Do you know that there's Bible translations that said the word was a God? And not only the cults, there's one of the newer versions that does the same thing. You just change one little word or another, you can change the meaning of the contract altogether. I, in uh, my past position, I was contract negotiations was part of my responsibility. And the reason they chose me, they said, well, you're so detail-oriented and you on every little word. And I said, OK. 
me because I, I was creating policy for the company and this and that. And, uh, just one little example I was thinking about this, that if you were to change in a contract the word shall to the word may, you take all the teeth out of it altogether. And that's what we did. Oftentimes they would say, you know, such and such party shall do this, 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 and this. And we'd go in there and say, you know, maybe 15 pages of the contract. We'll go back up and we'll say, well, we've got a few issues with this. And they'll say, okay, well, you can make some adaptations. We'll have our legal staff look over it. And you go back and you change that shall to may. That's it. That's all you do. And you don't mention it. You don't say a word. And then you just send it back. Well, that means that everything that's in there, you may do it if you feel like it, but you don't have to. And that's what Satan does with God's word. And that's what it's so important that we know God's word. It's so important that we have, you know, in front of us a, a translation. And like I say, I'm, I'm a King James, New King James. I like the Geneva too. I don't like the ones that came out of Egypt. A lot of your new ones too, they're just as bad. But Jesus was telling them, you're going to see a time come when it's going to be the hearts and minds are wicked and evil and they're going to still be getting married. Well, now, when Jesus talked about marriage, it was more than just once. And, uh, and uh, I'll just read this and then we'll go back into Matthew. In uh, Revelation 19.6, and uh, this is John speaking, and he says, And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as the sound of many waters, and the sound of mighty thunderings, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Marriage Supper of the Lamb. You've been invited. You, got, you all got your invitation, didn't you? Didn't you? You got your invitation? What is that? What is that? that we'll be clothed in. The righteous acts. Sad to say that much of the world today and much of the church has sought to convince one another that even saying the word righteousness, how am I righteous through Jesus Christ? Am I tempted? Oh my, I hate it. I'm still in the flesh. But when that temptation does come and then the Holy Spirit is that one that's on this shoulder or on this shoulder, and I come to the Lord in prayer and say, Dear Lord, strengthen me through your spirit. Grant me that unction. I just love it what Jesus said in John chapter 15 when he says, I pray that your joy may be full, that my joy be in you. That the joy of Jesus is what gets us through every day to realize it's not our righteousness, but it's his and because he lives within us. Why? Because we've been born again. I, I just love the Right now, there's a lot of people that I grew up with and ran around with. They have uh, grew up around home, you know, small town, small community. And then they have gone away, as they say, and made their fortune. And now they're coming back. You know, they're getting out of the cities, coming back into the country. And, and uh, it's very hilly around where I live, a lot of brush and timber and trees and a lot of sawmills and things like that. And one of the guys that I ran around with quite a bit was... He, he said the other days, you know, he says, something to the effect, he says, you know, he says, wow, Bill, what happened? <laughs> he says, when did you get to know Jesus? And I said, you know, it's kind of like what Jesus told Nicodemus about the Holy Spirit. He says, you see the effect of it, but you don't know which way it comes and which way it goes, but you see and you feel the effect of it. And with me, one day, it was that I was, I remember being, I had a sense of awe that I was still alive. And for whatever reason, and believe me, I I'd often joke that I'd wore out three or four angels keeping me alive. 
continuing to walk and continuing to grow and to be nourished. Well, Jesus, he went on in Revelation 19, 9. He says, then he said to me, write, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true and sayings of God. The uh, references of the marriage and the understanding of the Jewish wedding has a lot to do with our sense of awe, or mine. And, and I see that as one of the problems that we have with the modern church and, and with those who call themselves Christians. Some of them, you know, you know, they're Christians, but they're walking around and they got their heads hanged down. And we got a popular phrase from some of the churches in town that said, oh, well, you know, you know, we're all sinners. The only difference between us and anybody else is that we're saved sinners. And I thought, oh, man, I feel so sorry for you. Come to me, brother. I'll, I'll pray with you. Maybe you haven't heard these things, but in a small town, you kind of you kind of rub shoulders with everybody. Uh, turn to Matthew 22, 1. We're not very far. Matthew 22, 1. And uh, what is the end result, the end desire of saying, I'm a Christian, I believe in Jesus Christ, he has saved me from my sins? What is the end result, the end desire? Who wants to go to heaven? Not very excited. Really? Really? You can. What did Jesus say here, right there at the beginning? Right there, Matthew 22, 2. He says, the kingdom of heaven is like. kingdom of heaven is like. Now, what he's going to be describing us in the next couple of parables is the kind of people, the crowd that we're going to be around. Okay, well, now, we know that whenever we have examples of what the kingdom of heaven is like in the book of the Revelation, you know, which is just fantasyable. I mean, it's just wild like wow you know angels flying around singing holy 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 I loved you guys singing the holy 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 I just love that I I uh, yeah I just love that song it uh, years ago you ever notice you ever think about you know times whenever you've worshiped you've had a, you've had that wonderful sense of worship and it just can't get any better you know I, I used to drive a truck. I did local drop and hook in Kansas City. That's 20 years ago. And our company, we served the caves. That's what we did. I don't know if anybody's ever heard about the caves in Kansas City. Kansas City is hollow. And uh, it's warehousing. There's cities underground. And uh, been that way since the 50s. But anyhow, and of course, since in the caves, there's a ventilation issue, and you got these semis running in and out all the time, you know, and everything. And so you got to shut your truck. You can't leave your truck going. I mean, you got to shut everything off. I mean, as soon as you can't, you can't let it idle at all. I mean, the cave cops will be on you. And, uh, and some of them go back for a mile. And, uh, but of course, if you're in a cave, and of course, it's huge, you know, because you got 13 sick trailers coming in all the time. You walk down there and just, just all of a sudden, just get filled with the Spirit and just, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. And then you just hear it going. Worship the Lord with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Give him power, honor, and glory. And then that. That verse that Jesus said in, in John 15, I pray that your joy be full, that my joy may remain in you. That's the appreciation and the understanding, the assurance that we have when that time does come. Would it be right now? I mean, right now, they could look around and every one of these, pew, every one of these chairs could be empty. And we would be kneeling before him, giving him glory. Thanking him for all the things that we knew or that didn't know in our lives that he had intervened and kept us safe, kept us alive, gave us another moment, another another time, another chance. Like this right here is, you know, 
Oh, I, I, for years, I'd said I felt bad about that, and, and I think I apologized to Dennis every pastor's conference since then. But I was sorry that I didn't go that time, that I, I was afraid my car would break again. The kingdom of heaven is like, Matthew 22, 2, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son. In, in the Hebrew life, the marriage, it was arranged, and the father of the groom took care of it. The father of the groom, he took care of it. He had to pay, he paid the dowry. He paid the price. He paid the price for the bride of Christ. See where this is going. Jesus Christ paid the price for you and I. He paid our entrance fee. You know, I see people today that they don't appreciate. I, I just, it, it gets to me, as I draw closer to the Lord, and he draws closer to me, it just bugs me when it seems like people don't appreciate the sacrifice. When you th- when Jesus was hanging upon that cross, you know, I just love the hymns. I just love them. But there's one that says, you know, on a hill far, far away. That cross wasn't far away. Now, far away in time from us, but those people that were on that hill, John and the Marys, all the other disciples had scattered. They fulfilled prophecy. Strike the shepherd and the flock shall scatter. They were there talking to Jesus while he was bleeding out. Appreciate the sacrifice. Verse 3, And sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding, and they were not willing to come. Again, he sent out other servants, saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen, my fatted cattle are killed, and all things are ready. Come to the wedding. Jesus is not only giving us an example of wedding, but he's also telling us a history lesson of the Jewish people. Stephen would do the same thing, and then Stephen would get stoned for it. And all he did was all the, the Sermon of Stephen. All it is is just starting in, in uh, Acts chapter 6, or 7, I'm sorry, Acts chapter 7. All it is is a history of Judaism. But they didn't want to hear it. Verse 5, but they made light of it and went their ways, one to his own farm, another to his business, and the rest seized the servants, treated them spitefully, and killed them. Who were the servants of the king? The prophets. And the prophets got martyred. How many of them were beaten and stoned? And But when the king heard about it, he was furious, and he sent out his armies and destroyed those murderers and burnt the city. Uh, think about the different times that the city of Jerusalem has been destroyed. Or when uh, you know, Nebuchadnezzar came back in, when he finally, you know, after the third time, he came back into Jerusalem, and they were just laying waste to it. They told him about this prophet that had named him in his writings. And he had to go meet Jeremiah. Oftentimes God allows the wicked and the evil to bring about judgment. Because if the people don't want God, God's going to say, okay. Well, then he said to his servants, The wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Therefore, go into the highways, and as many as you find, invite to the wedding. So the servants went out into the highways and gathered together all whom they found, both bad and good, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. Hallelujah. Both bad and good. You know, that's it's interesting. If you go to think, what if, you know, people talk about the rapture, and, and there's even a group around our town that they're, Every time they hear of something horrible happening, they almost applaud it. Because they say, well, that's one more evil thing. God has got to rapture us out right now. And I said, that's horrible. Because there could be one more person to be saved. I mean, what if 45 years ago the rapture had happened? I'd have seen the highway to hell. Seriously. 
In fact, I can remember driving a 9600 Ford tractor with a with a FM radio fender mount open station. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Maybe not. It's a big tractor, fender mount radio, like the speakers like the kids have now that boom boom. I can remember driving that listening to Highway to Hell. From the Antichrist Devil Child, sure. But he said, you go out and invite them. And this, I, I truly believe that this is, you know, he's talking about the time of the Gentiles. He's talking about us. He's talking about those, you know, the, both good and bad. And then the wedding hall was filled. But when the king came in to see the guest, he saw there was a man there who did not have a wedding garment. And he said to him, friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. And then the king said to the servants, bind him, ham and foot, take him away, cast him into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. I, I truthfully think then that can be also tied into the parable of the tares and the wheat. The tares and the wheat. I thought about that just yesterday. We finally had rain earlier this week. We had almost five inches and just hardly anything ran off. It's just beautiful. Everything just so beautiful. And I'm seeding down my new yard. And uh, the, the grass seed, I was late getting it done and all that because I had to bring my yard back from the big pile and, and all that stuff. And anyhow, the, the little grass is just I think I see some green, you know, that type of thing. Well, quack grass. Anybody familiar with quack grass? You don't know what that is? Well, anyhow. Okay, you know what I mean. Oh, it's, and, and I'm going like, no, I want to, and I walked across the little thing over here, and I thought, I want grass like that. Well, anyhow, I just walked around, and of course, quack grass, boom, it shot up, and I reached down and pulled out the quack grass, and there's a root ball that big around. And of course, everything. You know, and then I think about you know the parable of the tares and the wheat, and, and and they said you know why don't you go and you do it right now? Look, somebody snuck in at night and they see these tares and it. What was he said? No. Because if I take them out, then I'll take out some of the others. And I have to think also there is a time, you know, as Peter said, he said, that, you know, he, God would that none should perish but all come to repentance. Continue to pray for the lost. Continue to pray for those who would spitefully abuse us and, and, and scoff and make fun. Continue to pray. Pray our hearts not become hard. That's one of the things that when we gather at the, at the pastor's conferences, we're always talking about or somebody's always bringing up, you know, pray my heart, not get hard. You know, as we continue to pray. You know, for as, even though, as Paul said in Romans chapter 12, down somewhere around 12, I believe, he said, if it be possible, live peaceably all with all men. So, you know, maybe there's some people we just need to separate from. Now, the wedding... And, and this may be kind of interesting, but of course, you know, we talk about the wedding, and we talk about that a lot of times during Christmas time, whenever we talk about Mary and Joseph, how he was, they were betrothed. Okay, now I'll run through this just right quick, and this is a depiction of what the Jewish wedding would be like. Now, the betrothal was a legally binding covenant contract that showed the couple was officially married, but they were not allowed to share the physical benefits of marriage until the marriage ceremony, which would come a year later. Now, whenever they were to be married, then they would gather and they would be under what they would call a, a chupa, a, a, we call it now a, a wedding arch, or have you, have you seen those where people, you know, they say, oh, we gotta have the arch. You know what I'm talking about? Well, this goes back to then, and it is symbolic of being covered by the Holy Spirit as you gather under that ark. So, or the, the, the blessings of God, that's, that's what that is. That's symbolic. That goes clear back to the time of the Jewish. And, the, uh, of course, the, in the times of Jesus, the betrothal, the marriage contract, and uh, that covering 
was and showed that you were covered by God. Now the bridegroom would offer the bride a ring and a gift and would also drink from a cup of wine, offering her in marriage. And this was a year before the actual ceremony. This is when the betrothal would made. This is when the father of the groom had made the arrangements and, and made the arrangement to pay for the ceremony. So he would offer her a drink of, from the cup of wine, where she too would drink from the same cup. And once she was finished, the covenant would be sealed and they would be considered a legally married couple, although they would be called the betrothed. And at this time, the bridegroom would tell the bride, I shall not drink from the fruit of the vine until I drink it with you in my father's house. Does that sound familiar? Okay, you know where, you know where this goes right along. And that's one of the things that I see with a lot of the modern stories that are told about the Bible is that they don't have an understanding of the observation part or what were the customs of the Jews. And that makes all sense when you look at it like that. The betrothal would be a spiritually binding between the two and after a year, the physical consummation would occur. There would be a waiting period of one year to ensure that the bride was, was pure and at this time, the bridegroom would return to his father's house during that year, which was called the Urison period, in order to add a room, and there would be a new dwelling place. I tell you, I, I go away to create a dwelling. You heard that? Yeah, we read that a lot of funerals, you know. That's uh, John 14. You know. At his father's house. The bride would be busy with her bridesmaids purchasing items to make her wedding dress and the bridesmaid dresses. And once the year was approaching, the bride and her bridesmaids had to, to be dressed and ready for the bridegroom's arrival. That was intimate. It was imminent. They knew it was happening. They had to be ready. The, the bridesmaids. Who are the bridesmaids in the wedding of, at, at the marriage supper of the Lamb? It's the church. You have to be ready. That's what they're telling us. Now, traditionally, the bridegroom would not know the day or the hour of the wedding, which would occur, neither would the bride. It was a day and a time that only the father of the bridegroom knew. What did Jesus did just tell us? No one knows but the father. So the bridegroom, too, would have to wait, greatly anticipating a special day. Once the father decided that it was time to get the bride, this happened in the middle of the night. The bridegroom would have a shofar that he would blow, like a trumpet, and this would wake up the townspeople. They would have, to, they would have also have been anticipating his arrival, and they would meet him outside in order that this be a wedding procession. Once the bridesmaids heard the shofar, they have to make sure that they had enough oil in their lamps to not only get the bride up quickly, but to last as they walked back to the bridegroom's father's house in the dark to help light the way. Well, the door to the wedding would be shut, and any late covers would literally be shut out of the wedding. The guests would meet and greet, and once the consummation complete, the bridegroom would bring out the, to, to show the blood, and it was at this time that they would rejoice because of the sign of the blood. The shedding of blood sealed the covenant, for without the shedding of blood, there was no binding contract. Interesting. Interesting. Now, if you would, uh, I have one more place, and that is uh, Matthew 25. Matthew 25, we're going to, bear with me, we're just about there. Once again, Want to know what the kingdom of heaven is going to be like? What does he say right there? 
Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins. Now to me, this is one of the saddest parables that there is. Who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Who do we have? We have ten virgins. There are ten, let's just say there are ten people. They are all trying to keep themselves pure, unstained, unspotted from the world. All ten of them. All ten of them have some sense of morality. All ten of them are anticipating the coming of the, of the bridegroom. All ten of them, they have a knowledge or an understanding of God's word. All ten of them. Now five of these are wise and five were foolish. Uh, that word foolish, today we, we use that flippantly. We say, oh, they're a fool. But if you go back and you read how many times that word fool is used, like in the Proverbs and such, that word fool means that they were without hope. They were without understanding. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them, but the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. That's kind of the way we are, aren't we? I mean, yeah, we're ready. But if I knew that it was going to happen in like four seconds, we'd be all up just going, holy, holy. You know what I mean? So, yeah, we're ready, but, and that's what he says, you know, be ready, but we're still about to go about the, the you know, the business of living. Oh, we're still about that. You know, you know, that's what the Apostle Paul, when he was talking to the church, he said, you know, he says, I did not intend for you not to associate with the, you know, the wicked, the whoremongers, the, the adulterers and all that. Because if you never associated them, how are they going to find out about Jesus? Some of us who've worked in different settings, and whether it's factories or I worked with a lot of truck drivers. Back years ago when I was driving a truck and we'd all be sitting in, in, in line in warehouses and I'd go down the line, because you may sit there a couple hours unloading, and I'd knock on doors and, what are you up to? Oh, nothing, blank, 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 wait, 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 you know, that type of thing. And I'd say, have you got a good book? And I'd go to hand out Bibles. And a lot of times I'd, you know, I'd, that blankety blank, blank, and I'd say, well, have a blessed day, you know, go on. Jesus said, you, you get into a place in time like that, don't argue with them. Just kick the dust off your feet and go on. You don't want to get your feet and your shoes dirty. And here we have those. And at verse 6, and at midnight, the cry was heard. Remember what I we just talked about, how the traditional Jewish wedding, the order of service, how things went, Nobody knows the day of the hour, but God the Father. Nobody knows the day of the hour, but the dad, the father, the one who has paid the price, the one who has made the call, the one who has invited. Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. Then all these virgins arose and trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there should not be enough for us and you go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves and while they went to buy the bridegroom came and those who were ready went in with him and the wedding and the door was shut afterwards the other virgins came also saying lord lord open to us but he answered and said assuredly i say unto you i do not know you watch therefore for you do not know the day nor the hour in which the son of man is coming I, I often think of Matthew chapter 7 where he talks about the servants and he says, well, I tell you that those will come on that day where they will say, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Have we not taught in your name? Have we not preached in your name? And Jesus will say to them, depart from me, you doers of iniquity, you who practice sin and encourage others to do it. The sad thing is we see all of this going on today. Well, that most wonderful verse that we have in Hebrews chapter 10, verses. 
Hebrews, Hebrews 10 and 20 and 21. Anyhow, it says, uh, do not forsake the assembly of one to another, which is the habit of some, but that we are to gather together to stir up one another to love and good works. Encourage one another. Encourage one another, being filled with the love of Jesus and the holiness and righteousness. That's why we gather here today, to worship God. I mean, it's just, you're so blessed to have people that would stand up to do worship. We, I keep losing my piano players. I mean, it's small country churches, and they pass away. I've gone through about six. They had some folks that used to come up from St. Joe, and they'd do worship and play guitar and stuff. And, and, and when winter comes and they got to drive 50 miles, that, you know, that, that kind of knocks the enthusiasm. So blessed here. So blessed that people gather and worship God in spirit and truth. So blessed that the Word of God says what it says. There will be those, and, and there were a couple of things that the devil will bring at us. And one of the things is when Satan comes at us, that, and you know, the interesting thing is that I get challenged more from so called church people than from those people that are, you know, totally out there. And I truly believe it's because as, uh, you know, Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy, he says, for those will come that have a form of godliness but deny the power thereof. We have the power to continue to persevere. Why? Because it's the Holy Spirit. It's the word of God that, 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 uh, that resides within us. It's knowing that those who have gone before us have, have, have laid the, fra the, the framework, the foundation, as to which then we have his word that, that continues. When we think about the, uh, the wedding, I think about uh, that when I perform a marriage, as I said earlier, there was a time when, and I don't know how many, marriage licenses around Gentry County have my, mine and my wife's name both on it. But I do way more funerals than weddings. And one of the reasons is, is that I have a traditional vow and I will not deviate. I always encourage the couple to say something special to themselves, but when it comes to the vow, I have a traditional vow. Now granted, the actual vow itself is not word for word in the word of God. But the part that is, is, as Jesus said, for what God has joined together, let not man cast asunder or take apart. But whenever we come to that traditional vow, it's, it's kind of a, an understanding of what walking with the Lord can be like. You know, a lot of times people, when we think about the seed and the sower, I understand that because I've done that. I've seen that. And then, sad to say, I see that from the pulpit. I see that in the congregation. But you notice when we get to that vow, for better for worse, for richer for poor, in sickness and in health, till death do us part. Think about that as our walk with the Lord. Sometimes we have really good times and we're praising the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Other times it's tough. It's tough. And then there's sickness at times. My wife and I have been together 40 years. And before that, uh, well, I was drinking buddies with her brother. I didn't even know her because my mother-in-law-to-be owned a bar. My brother-in-law then, cirrhosis of the liver, got him at 42. He continued. That's why I'll, I'll so often have people come up and, you know, and oftentimes they'll say, so you're Bill Brack? And I say, yeah. And they say, say something, because I guess my voice hasn't changed, but the rest of me has. Because I've been born again. Been born, ever, anybody here born again? Hey, I like that. I like that. Now, when I said the one about heaven earlier, you all were a little... Uh, <laughs> My prayer that I leave here today, and I want to thank you all for having me up. And, and like I say, it's answered prayer because I, I don't know how many times I told Dennis, man, I'm sorry I didn't come up. 
because I had the offer. I had the offer. I had the opportunity to share the love of Jesus. And uh, and I think back. This is the first time on a Sunday I have not been to two churches on Sunday morning for at least 15 years. So this is this is a blessing. They were, when I told the elder, he was like, "What?" <laughs> That's good for him. It's good for him. For for people to you know to step up and to share. You know, and and don't be afraid to you know walk out there and, and let people know that it's because of Jesus Christ I live. And the Word of God. And I hope the the connections that we see. And how that we know that the next time we go through, God will add a little more understanding and a little more and a little more, and our trust will grow in Him a little more and a little more. And, and that sense of, of reason and human logic will, eh, that may make more money and be more profitable. As I said, when I, when I quit my day job, I was making a big salary, and I had no retirement. I had nothing. And, but they offered me this little country church, 150 a week, and I said, yes. At that time, my wife got sick, became disabled. God provides. Here two years ago, our house burned. We lost everything. God provides. And, uh, I uh, kind of like a lot of you. I miss my dear friend Dennis, but I know one day he, we will be worshiping together. Amen. Let's all bow our hearts. Dear Heavenly Father, we praise you, Lord, and Lord, I thank you for the privilege to gather here this day. Lord, I pray that uh, the eyes of our understanding have been opened, has been increased. Lord, as we impatiently await that Amen. God bless.